Page 6. Rethinking Human Evolution, by Jeffrey H. Schwartz, 2017. Chapter 1. The Deceptive Search for Missing Links in Human Evolution, 1868-2010 1.2 What Makes Paleoanthropologists Stick? While the above list of discoveries is not exhaustive, it is sufficient to permit identification of a common paleoanthropological practice, namely, the twofold strategy of claiming that one's discovery is likely a direct evolutionary link to living humans and of displacing other specimens from this position, if necessary. There appear to be several closely related motivations for this practice. Scientific fame, prestige. Without doubt, the discovery of a claimed missing link attracts more attention than discovering a specimen that is deemed an evolutionary dead end. Indeed. The pursuit of recognition within and beyond the boundaries of one's discipline is a common feature of scientific endeavors, paleoanthropology being one. As Josh Tomchik, 2004, 234, summarized the situation, paleoanthropologists are in no way different from other people, they want to be popular, they are desirous of fame and they compete against each other. The interpretation of fossil material provides ample opportunities for such contests. Media Attention The media for example, radio, television, documentaries, popular science magazines, semi-popular books, and even high-impact scholarly magazines and journals are likely to cover an event announcing the discovery of a new missing link, especially if it impacts views of human evolution. Larson 2000. 2, Lewin 1987, 1318. This is so even at the risk of distorting the scientific message in order to attract public attention, White 2000. 288, 289-2009, 127-128. The advent of the Internet, and its uncontrolled exploitation by individuals wanting to promote their perspective at the expense of other and often more informed presentations has only exacerbated the problem of fame first, science second, Cardmill 2000. Funding Imperatives Funding agencies are usually more generous when significant discoveries, such as those dealing with missing links, are involved. Of course, the notion that finding missing links is more significant than finding fossils deemed dead ends is misguided. After all, if the goal of science is to reveal the complete story, the discovery of evolutionary dead ends is as crucial to understanding this picture as discovering presumed missing links. Unfortunately, given increasingly limited financial resources, funding agencies are forced to weigh the potential impact of the research projects they subsidize. Consequently, the search for a potential missing links is intrinsically more appealing than adding another specimen to a known fossil record, especially if this merely corroborates the identity of evolutionary dead ends. Just being lucky Whether consciously or unconsciously, those who discover fossils find themselves in the position of taking liberties with scientific practice that result in stretching interpretation to include missing links. An excellent example of this intellectual contortion is provided by Louis Leakey's behavior in the late 1950s and early 1960s. As then, but not previously, a proponent of the moderate pre-sapiens hypothesis, Leakey consciously sought to demonstrate that the lineage leading to Homo sapiens had ancient phylogenetic roots, and that its earliest participant were not too ape-like or primitive. Indeed. With the 1959 discovery in Upper Bed 1 of Old Uvai Gorge, Tanzania, of the partial cranium allocated to Zingenthropus, and the recovery of primitive stone tools elsewhere in Upper Bed 1, Leakey could not resist the appeal of humanizing an otherwise primitively large-jawed, large-toothed, and small-brained hominid by imbuing it with tool-making behavior. Nevertheless, the challenge of reconciling his pre-sapiens hypothesis with Zingenthropus as toolmaker became moot with the discovery in the early 1960s of an array of specimens that Leakey et al. 
1964, presented as representing the same hominid, Honhobalus, that was perceived overall as being more gracile than Zinjanthropus and that may have been the genuine creator of upper bed one stone tools. All along, it seemed, Leakey was correct a pre-sapiens hominid, Homo habilis, and not something Zinjanthropus like, was the progenitor of the human lineage. Perhaps there is a lesson to be learned here. Although most discoverers will err in their phylogenetic interpretations, and specification of missing links, some will be correct. Proposing the discovery of a missing hunk has, therefore, a lot to do with being lucky. In other words, one may eventually be right, but not always for the right reasons. For all the reasons listed above, paleoanthropologists have a strong incentive to find missing links. Unless the paleoanthropological community eventually agrees on rules of engagement that bind all scholars with respect to fossil discoveries, there seems little hope that things will change. To sum up, 1. Scientists in human evolution are often driven by extra-scientific considerations, including fame, media attention, funding, and being lucky, along with a few other reasons, and, 2. Much of this is due more to the sociology of the sciences than to scientific or epistemic rigor. One need not be alarmed that science has a sociological dimension, but one should be worried when this dimension predominates. That discoverers repeatedly claim to find missing links, even though most of them will be wrong as they themselves probably suspect is troubling, and it reveals paleoanthropology's lack of rigor and scientific maturity a responsibility also shared with non-discoverers, as will be shown. Apparently, there is still room for improving paleoanthropology's procedures. The Cunning of Reason, Hegel, How Paleoanthropology Achieved Its Goals Thus Far Despite Self-Interested Scholars Leaving aside the normative enterprise that revising paleoanthropology's procedures would require, I would like to examine the practice of paleoanthropology as revealed by its history. It is my contention that preparing the ground for a more rigorous paleoanthropology can only be done in light of its past. In a nutshell, progress on conceiving human evolution was significant between the 1860s and the 1970s, but has been less so since. Why such a difference in the rate of progress? Contrary to what one might expect, the number of fossil discoveries is not the only important factor. Scholars in the early phases of development of the field were committed to amazingly divergent views of human evolution, views that went well beyond what can be imagined today. To look back at this early phase is not unlike visiting the twilight zone. At this juncture, another aspect of this paper's thesis should be mentioned. Commentators, like producers, in the area of human evolution are not always acting in the best interest of their field by sometimes adopting views based on wild guesses and preconceptions. These guesses are best seen in the disparity of positions once taken by scholars on four key debates. 1. Early phylogenetic perspectives permitted searching for humankind's closest living relatives among the entire primate spectrum, hominoids old and new world monkeys, and even prosimians. This diversity of views was gradually narrowed to apply to the great apes, then to African apes, and now only to the chimpanzee. 2. It was once debated whether humans and their closest living relatives were descended from a common ancestor that was more human-like or more ape-like in conformation. The debate was eventually resolved in favor of the latter view. 3. Previously, the time frame suggested for the emergence of humankind from its nearest living relative varied considerably, encompassing the entire tertiary period, Pleistocene, Pliocene, Miocene, Oligocene, Eocene, and Paleocene, and sometimes even beyond, Cretaceous. This time range has been substantially compressed to the very last portion of the tertiary, Mid-Miocene and after. 4. 
the geographical range proposed as humankind's cradle used to include nearly the entire surface of the planet, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. This is now restricted to the tropical zones of the Old World. With this original disparity of hypotheses, progress eventually came because a number of fossils, or their persistent absence in some regions and geological horizons, tipped the balance in each of these four debates. Since about 1980, paleoanthropology has rested on what could be called a near consensus. Indeed, the scientific framework used to think about human evolution ever since has been confined to the following. A human lineage descended from something ape-like that inhabited the tropical regions of the Old World post-Mid-Miocene. Although this still leaves room for disagreement, the progress made to get there must be appreciated at its full value. In the current age of near consensus, it must also be realized that progress will be harder to achieve in the future. For while it is relative easy to choose between two widely different hypotheses as they often presented themselves in the earlier history of the field it is much more difficult to choose between hypotheses sharing many similarities, as is now the case. The practice of paleoanthropology in the context of a near consensus requires more powerful tools of resolution than in the past. Before proceeding to review the history of the field, let us explore further the various impediments on the road of paleoanthropology. Let us insist on two main points. The first point, until today debates in paleoanthropology have been conducted in a rather loose and undisciplined fashion. Scholars have been free to express their personal preferences and preconceptions in a number of ways. Page 8. 